This is Jeff Ambrick with the Washington Film Lacrosse Officials Association, and this is a quick presentation for the scorers table. We're going to review all the stuff that you need to know to be able to work with the officials and keep an accurate recording of what's happening on the field. So here we go. Thanks, Keith, for the wonderful introduction. Again, I'm Leonard Ruff. I've been helping with the Huskies uh, lacrosse program since my son played starting in 2006, and I guess I just can't let go. Um, it has been a wonderful, wonderful experience for me, and I really applaud you all for volunteering and coming out. I think I saw a show of hands that most of the folks here are first-timers. Is that right? How many are first-timers? About 50-50. Oh, okay, that's great. So how many are uh, helping at the youth level and middle school and, <laughs> and high school? Okay, so mostly high school. Great. All right. So. <clears throat> What we're going to talk about today is a real focus on the activities and responsibilities at the table, so primarily timekeeping and scorekeeping. Um, uh, I guess I first wanted to ask if anybody here, if you have any particular questions or topics that you want to make sure we touch on. So we're going to go through some basics about the game. Uh, this is a handbook I put together quite a long time ago. Um, talk about the field layout just to give you an orientation on that. The important part of that field layout is for you to understand that you have a zone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. <clears throat> um, the point of going over the field layout is that I want everybody to understand that the, the table has a zone that they control. And it's really important, uh, I think especially in the, the younger levels, where a lot of kids are still learning the game, they're still learning the mechanics of substitutions and where they should be, and you're part of that. And you're also a, really a part of the official uh, officiating crew. You're responsible, especially as the home team, you're responsible for the book, you're responsible for the game time, you're responsible for tracking penalties and penalty time. So you're really an integral part of the game. When you step into that scores area, you kind of step away from being a parent <clears throat> and being a part of the official uh, officiating crew, so to speak. And the more you can understand about the game and the more you can understand about the mechanics, not only helps your team and the other team too, but it gives you a much broader or, uh, appreciation for the game. And I think that enhances your understanding and enjoyment of the game. And of all places on the field, being the score table is the best place to watch the game, although it can be total chaos. <laughs> I'll guarantee it. I mean, today we just, we just played our first game for the Huskies against the Washington, uh, Western Washington Vikings. And again, I've been doing this for 15 years, and there's sometimes I'm struggling to catch up because it happens so fast, especially at the college level because we have people you know, scoring right off of face-offs and you almost can't put your head down until they settle into an offensive set where you can kind of catch up with some of the stats. So we'll talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> so for the first thing, um, so there's four basic positions, especially for those that aren't quite familiar with the game. We have our offensive players, which are called attack, and they are generally sequestered to one end of the field, the, that team's offensive end of the field. Then there are the midfielders, three midfielders, and generally speaking, the midfielders are those players that move back and forth depending on their offense or on defense. If teams are a little bit more sophisticated or if they have enough players, teams will have dedicated what they call midfield lines. So you might hear coaches yell out, first middies up, second middies up, and they'll run those because the midfielders do a lot of running. Us old D guys like myself, we didn't have to run quite so much. But the midfielders, they run a lot. So they have to swap in and out pretty quickly. And if the coaches do have a luxury of some dedicated players, they will have set players that are considered offensive midfielders and set players that are considered defensive midfielders. So you'll see midfielders swapping in and out a lot more. On the defensive half of the field, we have the defensemen. And they, again, are generally uh, in the defensive half of the field. And they have to stay there. You can move, but you have to swap a person back and forth. 
So a midfielder will go ac across to allow a defender to go forward if they have the ball and if they have an opportunity. So you'll see, and this will just kind of help you track the game, you'll see in many cases where a defender might pick up a ball and see an opening and say, well, I've got a chance to get down there and establish a fast break for my team. And you'll hear people call out, midi back, midi back. And on a good team, you'll see a midfielder stop at midfield, hold up their cross and say, I'm back, you can go. So just to help you watch that. And then, of course, the last person on the defense is the goalkeeper. And the goalkeeper has a very special zone around them called the crease, upon which no other offensive player could go. Uh, defensive players can go in the crease. Um, there are certain limitations, of course, on the goalkeeper. But uh, once he steps out of the crease, he's a lacrosse player like anybody else on the field. And he can be checked. So as far as equipment, we have the cross, which is the stick, more commonly called the stick. There are three kinds. There's the traditional stick, which is the attack players and midfield players use, and that's the short stick. There's the long stick that the defenders, and also a position called long stick midfielder can use. And then there's the goalie stick with the big head. You've probably all seen those already. Um, helmets, mouthpiece, gloves, shoulder pads, chest pads for the goalies. So one thing that's really important for the coaches to understand is they are responsible for the proper equipment of their players. And the referees at the beginning of every game will approach both coaches and say, are your players equipped to play by rule, uh, uh, equipped by rule? Because if they don't have a mouthpiece, they don't have a helmet, if they don't have the shoulder pads, they can't play. So again, as parents, I think we probably all know how fuzzy a lot of uh, youth players are about responsibilities, so we can always help to keep uh, our players, oh, that's good. Oh, you zoom in a little, all right. I just moved it a little bit. Okay. Um, so we can all help those kids show up uh, with all the proper equipment. I know even in college when my son was playing, he'd show up with a home jersey when they were away and it's just, <laughs> you never know. So the rules, so 10 players on a side, on the field at any one time. Of course, we have the goalkeeper, three defenders, three midfielders, and three attackmen. Uh, let's see, at high school, it's 12 minute quarters. Is that right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, a few things uh, the face off, and we can talk a little bit about some of those mechanics, but basically, at the beginning of every quarter or, at the, or after each score, Two midfielders will face off at the midpoint of the field. Um, there's a lot of very specific rules about that. Um, one of the things that I do is I have a sheet here and I can pass it around. Since the standard scorebook doesn't have a place to track who won the face offs, who got the ground balls, were there face off violations, I created just a simple Excel spreadsheet. And what I do, is I write down the number of the opposing face, uh, face offers. Is that a good word? We're making up words. <laughs> Facing off, uh, face off specialists, the two players that are facing off. Uh, I circle the number of the player when his team wins the face, face off. Now, that face off specialist, even if somebody else on his team gets the ground ball and awards the face off, he is awarded the face off win. He doesn't get the ground ball, maybe. He can if he's the one that gets the ground ball. So what I do is I circle the player that wins the face off, and then I write down the number of the player that actually got the ground ball, and then I transfer that into my book, into the actual scorebook. But this just helps me get a little record. It give me, gives me a back check on tracking those face offs. So I can pass that around here. Now, there are occasions where you can win the face-off but not award a ground ball. A, a ball that's loose could be deflected out of bounds by the opposing team, and then this team gets the face-off win, but no ground ball. Or if there was a, an infraction on the face-off, like withholding or a push or something, the offending team loses the face-off, the winning team gets the face-off, but is not awarded a ground ball. So. These are just some of the, the terms, and we can go through these really quickly. So 
you know, catching, receiving a pass with, uh, uh, with your cross, checking, that's attempting to dislodge the ball. And again, there's two kinds of checking that happen in a game. There's a stick check, which is supposed to be stick on stick. And then there's a body check, bodily contact. And again, those, those body checks can only come from the sides and the front. If someone gets checked from behind, then that'll be a penalty. Okay. Uh, there's all kinds of different <laughs> kinds of uh, checks, uh, but one thing you will see is cradling. You'll see a lot of people that first watch lacrosse think it's very odd that these guys are running around and they're moving their sticks back and forth, back and forth. That's called the cradle, and that's a way to keep the ball back in the pocket while you're running. Otherwise, it'll just fall out. And I still don't understand how women's lacrosse does it with their very shallow sticks. I couldn't play with those crosses. Yeah. Um, so a lot of other things that you'll hear, a cutting is when a player is making an offensive move to get to an open position, to take a pass. A feed, you'll commonly hear that. That's when someone will send a pass to a player who then can, is in a position to take a shot. Uh, a scoop, it's picking the ball up off the ground, right? And that's generally when you're seen awarding a, a ground ball. Um, screening, that's when somebody gets blocked from following a defender. There's, there are rules about how far away from the ball that can occur. If it occurs too far away from the ball, then it's interference. And of course, shooting. Now, here's, here's one thing to note on the, on the uh, stats. A shot does not have to hit the goalie, does not have to hit the crossbar, does not have to go in. It's any, a shot is considered any time the ball is propelled towards the goal. Even if it goes wide, even if it goes 50 feet over the goal, it's still a shot. Now it's not necessarily a shot on goal, and in, at the college level it won't restart the shot clock, but it's still considered a shot. If it was a deliberate move to try to throw the ball to into the goal, then it is considered a shot. Okay, I'm gonna kind of skip over these terms, I and mean, we can send this out if anybody's yeah. here. Because I, I really want to focus on uh, just a lot of the mechanics of the game. So again, here's the field. So generally the field is broken into three areas. Uh, a defensive area, if the team is defending this goal, the midfield area, and then the attack area. And of course those are swapped for the other team. My defensive area is the other team's attack area, right? Where we're gonna be mostly focused here is the table area. So we have the substitution area that all players, when they're substituting in and out of the game, must transfer through that box. You'll hear it called that, the box. And you'll also hear people yelling, clear the box, when people are hanging out too long while they're waiting for their substitution or they think they're gonna go in or maybe their sub is late getting off the field. Then there's the coaches area directly flanking the substitution box. Then the team area directly behind that and one thing I will definitely emphasize, and this is true even at the college game, players all tend to creep forward and they start blocking your view down the sidelines. So it is totally within your realm of responsibility to ask players to back up. Now if a field has permanent markings, there will be a dashed line there that you can keep them back, but totally ask the players to back up. They should not be standing right behind the coaches. That coaching area should be kept clear at all times except for the coaches. So if all it takes is, you know, hey, black, move back, move back, guys get back, we can't see. Because you're trying to pick, pick, pick up both ends of the field and it can be a challenge when people are substituting in and out, <clears throat> the coaches are at the corner yelling, you'll have two or three coaches in the corner. It can be tough even at the college level, unless you're sitting up on a raised platform, which I don't think anybody is. So the, again, the thing I wanted to emphasize, <clears throat> this table area and that substitution area, that's your zone. That's your zone. So for instance, when players are serving penalties, they will be, they have to be in that substitution box. And where you want them, it's basically in front of the table. They can be on their side, of, but right in front of the table. And we, we want to make sure that those players are there so they're not interfering with players coming on and off the field during regular substitutions. First of all, they'll trip people up, they'll get hit, 
and they will always tend to stay close to the corner. And we'll go through some of the mechanics on penalties in a little bit. But when somebody's serving a penalty, you want them up close to the table so that they're not in the way. <coughs> so <coughs> game time prep, I mean, you're going to be part of that game time preparation. Now, you're mostly going to be responsible for the table, but it doesn't hurt to just check the field. Give the field a check. Make sure there's pylons at the corners. Um, a lot of coaches just use like traffic cones or little soccer cones, but they should be visible. And again, if you look at this field diagram, it's a very specific layout. Some teams make some stuff up, but the four corners, the far midfield center line, and then the two cones at the corners of the substitution box. You should never have a cone right there in the middle because that's just going to get in the way. But sometimes people do that. Sometimes teams will also put cones at the restraining lines which are the, basically the top of the defensive and attack area, and there should not be any cones there. So <clears throat> the home team is responsible for the field setup. That includes the actual field itself uh, and making sure that you've got all the right equipment at game time to run the game. So <clears throat> again, that, that scores table, that's your zone, and you're going to need, uh, obviously, some kind of timekeeping device, preferably one that's visible to the players on the field. So at the table, you obviously need to have some kind of clock that handles uh, game time and penalty time, uh, preferably for the game time, something that's visible to the players and the referees. Uh, you may not always have that. Uh, and some, some way to keep score, whether it's a flip chart or we have a uh, tabletop score timer and scorekeeper that we use that has electronic numbers. And then also a way to keep track of penalty time. So I don't know if these are still being made. This is the LAX clock. Um, it is a lifesaver. Uh, it's the best. I can't remember how much I paid for it. But you can track if you want to up to you can do four penalties in game time, or if you're running game time somewhere else, you can run up to five penalties at once on this clock. I'll pass it around, but please don't push the button that has the blue tape over it. You will regret that. <laughs> but uh, it's very simple to use. It's direct input. You don't have to go minute, 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 minute. You can just put in three zero for 30 seconds and you're good. And you can run, like I said, four simultaneous penalties. Um, the biggest trick there, and we'll talk a little bit about that, is just managing the release of those penalties at different times. That can get a little tricky. That's why it's nice to have someone dedicated to that. So two timers, game timer, penalty timer, scorebook, scoreboard. And it's also a good idea to have a couple extra game balls at the table if the refs need one for a face-off or they can't get any uh, really quick. So the people, the people that you want at the table. Um, first of all, I want to say one thing, and that is, while it's certainly wonderful to be there, especially with your team, it's not a socializing time. You really do want to stay focused on the game. You're there to support that team. You're also an independent part of that game. So it's not the place where you should be overly rooting for your team. Certainly a few words of encouragement to your players are great, um, but you're not cheering. You really shouldn't be cheering, right? So <clears throat> the timer, so I would say the minimum uh, staff would be three, maybe four. So at least you need a timer. Someone's going to run the clocks, and that's both for game time and or penalty time. If you have the chance to have somebody only focus on penalty time, it's very useful because trying to juggle a couple of clocks at the same time, making sure you start and stop them at the same time, it's a little tricky. It's a little tricky. So timer, a scorekeeper who's going to run your book and keep the official score. Remember, the home team is the official scorebook. And so you have to keep an accurate book. And there's nothing wrong with writing down a few notes on the side 
you know, as you're going through to try to remember what happened. Or there's a lot of situations in the games, like I said, uh, on a face-off, you'll get a face-off win, you get a ground ball, you might get a fast break, you'll get a shot, you'll get a goal, you'll get an assist, and within like five or six seconds. So there's nothing wrong with waiting a, sec a few seconds, especially after those face-offs, to let the game slow down a bit so you can actually put your head down and enter information into the book. That happened to us a couple of times today, even, where I had to depend on both memory and the spotter to catch up <laughs> with what, what was happening on the field. Because as, as you've seen, it, it can happen so fast. Right. So, and that brings us to the last person that you really want to have as a spotter. So usually uh, a lot of the coaches and refereeing crews, especially if you're a high school crew and you've only got two officials, you got a lead and a trail going both ways, uh, is to call, I usually, we usually call out a two minute, a one minute, and like a 20 second call when we're nearing the ends of the quarters, just as a courtesy. Because a lot of times if the only visible clock is at the table, the coaches can't see it. So it's just a courtesy to call that out when you get to those, those time marks. So they kind of know they're nearing the end of the quarter, end of the half. Uh, I guess the last, one of the last things just kind of in general, um, unless somebody's there helping the crew, a spotter, a timer, a scorekeeper, a stat keeper, there really shouldn't be anybody else there. So your aunts and uncles, your friends, uh, other kids, should not be in the table area. That really should be dedicated just to the crew that's helping to run that game. <clears throat> so pregame, getting set up. So <clears throat> you should make sure you're all ready to go at least 20 minutes prior to the game. I mean, we start doing game setup about two hours prior for the Huskies, but we're hauling in all sorts of canopies and chairs and pylons and all sorts of, well, I am with the help of the players. Um, but you really have to be ready to go. The officials show up at 20 minutes prior. They will check in with the table, make sure you have the questions. That's also a good time for you to tell the, uh, the referees if there are any discrepancies with the field or if there are any like bad spots on the field. Oh, watch out, there's a big hole down there or something or anything that's not quite exactly right. But you really want to be there ready to go ready to start the game at minimum 20 minutes prior. So always be there and, and ready to start. So the scorekeepers, uh, you probably will already have your, your team's lineup in the book, uh, unless there's been some changes. But before that game starts, you wanna get the uh, visitor's coach or assistant coach or whoever to come over and tell you or enter it. I prefer to have them enter it directly into the book. Now, one thing to really point out, because even at the college level, some coaches forget this. It's really important that this first player in the attack box is the in-home player. Have you heard that term before? Right, so a lot of coaches will forget this. So the in-home player, for instance, is a designated player that gets awarded like un, what would you call it, uh, unrecognized goofs and good things. So for instance, if we couldn't tell who actually scored a goal, the in-home player could get credit. If there's a bench foul or a team foul, the in-home player will serve that penalty. So it's really important that the coaches know that first person in this book is the in-home. So when the visiting coach or even your coach comes over and is filling out the book, make sure they understand in this case, our uh, number nine, Glenn Mahoney was in-home player. Yes. Yeah, I think with the exception of that in-home, I think you could fill that book in any way you like. I'm a traditionalist and so I do it by position. So I'll fill in all the way through defense and then all the subs underneath that. But again, you gotta make sure that you get the goalies down into the bottom because right, they've got different statute tracking. Include the goalie as one of the field players because they will get a ground ball. Goalies can even get shots and scores. I've seen that happen. Not a whole lot, but it does happen. So you gotta make sure the goalie is also on the field list and in the goalie box. Okay. <clears throat> 
So get the lineups done, make sure everybody's got their in-home correct, and then basically you're ready to start the game.